Welcome to The Contrarians, and tonight the topic is they just get better and better. Talking bands or artists that get better with each album. So without any further ado, let's get started. and we have a great topic tonight this is from our own martin popoff we are talking about bands that got better and better and better so they put out a stream of albums and maybe you had like a block of five perfect records or maybe their whole catalog so we've got a great panel here uh grumqua I'm, that's going to be hard for me yeah but it is going to be tough but we'll get through it we'll, we'll get learn through it. it and we've got <laughs> Tate davis later. here what's that <laughs> Sorry, I may change it later just to make it easier. Or I, we yeah. could call you by your real name. I am Jeff. Jeff. Let's go with Jeff. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's keep it going. So welcome, Jeff. I don't think, Jeff, have you been on any of the panels yet? Absolutely not. Okay. We've got uh, a we... newbie. We're going to haze Jeff tonight. We're He's yeah. going <laughs> to, we really won't haze him, but uh, Jeff, yeah. glad to have you tonight. This will be fun. Tate's been on many panels. He's yeah. a seasoned professional. He's a wise music swami, that's for sure. Wise uh, music sure. swami. We may have a couple of more people join us tonight. We're going to play it by ear. And if they do, we will welcome them and we will keep this moving. So like I said, we're going to talk about bands that just got better and better and better. So based since this was Martin's topic, I'm going to throw it over to Martin. I'm going to go Martin, Tate, and uh, Jeff, and we'll see. If we have more people show up, we'll just play it by ear. So, Martin, why don't you start us out since this was your topic? Yeah. Should I do all three, do you think? Uh, and then three, 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 or just one, one, one? How, what do you think? Oh. What do you want to hear? What do you guys think? Uh, we should do three, three, three. We I can think. do three, three. three. Yeah, Go let's, ahead. Yeah, let's it. move it along. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah. My, my The idea here came from, uh, I went on Sea of Tranquility recently, and we did a mashup ranking of UFO and Thin Lizzy. And it got me thinking, I think someone even suggested this in some way. And then I took a look at it. And the idea was that, um, boy, there are some catalogs out there uh, that, that seem to, you know, they have a starting point which may be the debut or not, not the debut, um, but they have a starting point and then they, they seem to get better and you, and you, and you would rank the next album higher and you would rank the next album higher and you'd probably rank the next album higher and it would go for a long time. It might not go for the whole catalog, but uh, that, that was sort of the idea. So one of mine that I've been pondering, and again, I've been thinking about these guys a lot lately because my last um, history and five songs with Martin pop off podcast episode um I, I did it on um, bands where he, here's your future in, in one song or your first song that shows the future sound. Right. And I got thinking all about the stones and I gave it a whole category, but then I started thinking about this one too. And I, I felt that this fits as well. So um, the stones to me uh, start with all that 60s stuff, which I barely even know. Right. I know my stones really well, but, but it's everything past there. So I, it starts in an era where I'm not really, completely on board i don't think it's the stone sound yet so that's what that whole podcast episode was about but as you get moving along i love satanic majesties you know we've got i just took out a few here for just to show but uh, to represent so there's one of the early ones aftermath um let it bleed you get in this era sort of like the, the harder hitting but still kind of bluesy and not very stonesy sound i don't think particularly yet you've got things like beggar's banquet in this era um you know you've got your sticky fingers and exile and to me what why do i why do i progress and get to you know we get through this goat's head soup and then we get to this uh complete mother of a box set, you know, the old uh, some girls thing. And I think some girls, you know, I've been I've been known to say some girls is my favorite Stones album. And I'm wondering, OK, so this this almost represents a category for me of of like a band in the 60s. So automatically I'm going to think they don't start that strong. Right. A lot of covers, a lot of just blues and pop and whatever. Bad, bad productions. But what why for me does it end up in into some girls? And I think for me, it's because I'm of the age that the so the stone started exactly when I started uh, the same way. Kit, you know, Kit, Kiss and me started my musical conscious in 1974. 
So Kiss started when I got my musical musical conscious, but the Stones started when I was born in '63, right? So that's it's funny. I I've got this Kiss Stones thing going, but um, so I think for me, what happens is um, this is the first time because I was an angry young metalhead my whole life too, and it's only by '78, '79 when I'm starting to listen to anything that is not metal. I think this is the first time when when the Stones are releasing an album. You know, I'm impressionable. I'm 15 years old. They're there. I'm seeing all the excitement around the Stones. And that's maybe why it ends up being my favorite Stones album. Uh, just one other point to make on the Stones. Um, in that episode I just did of my podcast, I, I point out that this has a lot of songs on it of that Stone sound. And that Stone sound kind of just gradually comes in on the over previous albums. But I I swear I could. I could be honestly stating the case that I think, you know, Exile, It's Only Rock and Roll, Goat's Head Soup, uh, Black and Blue, up to uh, up to this album, Some Girls, um, I could say that that's one. So that, that's my first one, a long run there. My second one is David Bowie. I feel kind of the same way, where it's got that 60s element where I'm not really particularly on board. I'm not on board. Just go through these quickly. I'm I'm a, a Bowie fan that is not a fan of this album or this this whole period particularly. So I do not like this whole glam era thing. Um, but it's almost like I feel like I'm starting to respect him and trust him as he becomes a chameleon and gets up into these sorts of records. And then I am loving this era. So I could easily, easily, easily be right, right through the whole Berlin period thing. We've got a California one in there, and this is a semi-Berlin period one, Lodger. I could easily, easily say, ah, yeah, you can rank all those first ones all in order, going up and up and up. Uh, and then I'm loving that Berlin period, and same thing, going up and up and up. And then for me, it ends with Scary Monsters. Uh, this is my favorite David Bowie album. And from here on, um, you know, my, my argument sort of falls apart, but I do find it funny that um, I could easily be close enough within a point or two on a 10 scale. I could go complete, straight, gradual, 45 degree angle up through the Bowie catalog getting to that. So that's my second one. Uh, my last one, uh, inspired by that episode we did with Pete, I could easily say that, um, boy, this one is almost complete, Thin Lizzy. Um, so we go from the debut through to this, they're basically the same sort of record. Um, through to the third album of the Eric Bell era. And I'm still just slowly on my way up. Um, so, you know, I'm the, these are my least favorite Thin Lizzy albums. Uh, I could go Nightlife next, easily enough. Um, and then sort of the, the um, well, then we've got Fighting. Um, and I think this is where they discover their sound. Uh, as I said in that podcast episode, I think Freedom Song and Wild One is where this band gets their sound. But that's neither here nor there for this argument. For, for this, it's like, this is the next best Thin Lizzy album for me. And then I have no problem putting Jailbreak at the bottom of the pack of this trilogy, which I think all go together. Jailbreak, Johnny, and uh, Bad Reputation. And I kind of have no problem putting them in that order. Still slightly, gradually rising order. Here's where it gets a little, a little disingenuous, but not terribly so. Um, so my three favorite Thin Lizzy albums would be the next three Thin Lizzy albums. Now, is it in this order? Is it in the Black Rose through Chinatown through Renegade order? Renegade is definitely my favorite Thin Lizzy album. I know that's a very weird choice, um, but mo most people, I think this is going to be the consensus one. I think people mainly pick Black Rose, but these three are my three favorites. So the whole Thin Lizzy catalog, that's every single album except this one, which is not my favorite Thin Lizzy album for sure. So Thin Lizzy, I think is my best example because that's, I think it's a dozen albums, something like that. And, and 11 for me could go, I could literally go, you know, frankly speaking, it wouldn't start much lower than about a six or a 6.5. And I, I'd work my way up to having a couple of tens in there, but they'd be nines and tens. So those are my three. Those are my three choices, Rolling Stones, Bowie, and uh, oh, so a couple of quick, uh, Honorable Mentions, Genesis somewhat through to Abacab, uh, UFO definitely through No, no Place to Run. And I, there were, I looked at a whole lot of other bands and I couldn't really find any. Status Quo a little bit up through Quo 1974. Uh, but that's it for me. Well, those picks are all contrarian, Martin, but and we shouldn't expect anything less from you. So 
but <laughs> you're picking the Bowies that, you know, yeah. Hunky Dory and oh my God, those are so great. Well, a lot of people love scary monsters. I know the Stones pick is a weird one with some girls. I mean, it could be, there's a lot of examples yeah, there. And then the Thin Lizzy, one. had I stopped at Black Rose with Thin Lizzy, I think a lot of people would have bought into that one. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Ladies and gentlemen, we all hear this stuff differently. And like we were talking about before, we're all trying to just turn you on to these things. So uh, we do want to hear what you think in the comments below. So please comment. Let us know what records you think are like just a wonderful span of records that just constantly improved. All right. I'm going to throw it over to Tate. Tate, nice to see you tonight. What's your uh, what's your three? So my, well, first of all, good to be back on here again after a little bit. Um, my first one in uh, this uh, kind of kind of revolving around this whole concept is Ambrosia. Ooh. Now, nice. Ambrosia began as a pretty full on progressive rock band with their debut album in 1975 with classics like nice nice very nice time waits for no one and you know world leave me alone and songs like that and that album is pretty full-on progressive rock maybe holding on to yesterday's a little bit commercial but for the most part Wrong. it's a very very well done you know american progressive rock band when there wasn't a whole lot of american progressive rock at the time and then uh, you know, starting with um, somewhere I've never traveled and, and especially on Life Beyond L.A., you kind of have uh, still more prog rock, but the commercialisms that we would see on 1980s, 180, which had, um, you know, uh, You're the Only Woman, You and I, and uh, Biggest Part of Me on it are starting to creep in there more so on life beyond LA than somewhere I've never traveled life beyond LA. You can tell that there's uh, that there's more uh, commerciality, if that's even a word um, in there. And then you get to 180, which had, which is like the big album for the most part, that's really uh, commercial with some proggy overtones. Um, it's got the, the big hits, the big hits on it. And then in 1982, it's a very interesting case because you have the album Rhode Island, which sees them uh, start to go back on what they did with nine uh, with 180 and introduce more prog elements on stuff like Ice Age and um, and endings and and how you can love me and um you know, it's just Joe Puerta and David Pack's um, ability to, uh, um, you know, kind of with their unique writing styles and uh, um, their somewhat unique uh, vocal delivery, able to craft songs that are both in a progressive uh, kind of more sophisticated vein and uh, just a full on pop with a full on pop sensibility like um I think that Ambrosia were just as good of a pop band as they were a progressive rock band and uh, Rhode Island. Well, not maybe, well, maybe not my favorite Ambrosia album, I think is just um, a, a great uh, document with their ability to be able to uh, compose engaging material in both veins. So essentially their creative path as they move from album to album agrees with you you think yes. it's a good a smart creative path yes. and that's why you yes. like it more and more now my favorite my my favorite ambrosia album is probably 180 because wow. um i i love i love the two hits on it um i know that's really uh you know that's kind of me selling out there but um i just think that the 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 material on there is so engaging and then probably like beyond la comes in at, at number two but just like you were saying martin the path i think just really um uh, uh kind of comes full circle on rhode island and uh, again joe puerta and david peck's um ability to to create songs in both the prog and pop vein uh, the next band is a spinoff band, um, a uh, um, a band from the early 90s that uh, got really big when no one really thought that they would. I'm talking about the Black Crows, but more specifically, I'm talking about the Black Crows spinoff 
project, the Chris Robinson Brotherhood, which is Chris Robinson essentially um, exploring his love of the Grateful Dead and the Jerry Garcia band and all of the offshoot bands. Um, and uh, with Big Moon Ritual, which was their debut, they released two albums in 2012, Big Moon Ritual and The Magic Door. It's very very kind of like late 70s Grateful Dead um, kind of Jerry Garcia band kind of sound where um, it's very laid back. Uh, the compositions are very sophisticated and there's this kind of like, um, you know, let's just all have a good time and, you know, sing about whatever. Um, and the uh, the compositions are are very hypnotic in in that sort of way. However, as you get further on into the discography, um, the album lengths for the most uh, for the most part become shorter, and it becomes more about the song. I think over the uh, the sort of like atmospheric jams. Now, by the time you get to twenty nineteen, Servants of the Sun. Uh, the the compositions on that particular album become much more colorful. Like the um, uh, the the keyboards kind of go from this uh, you know uh, like more organic like electric piano organ sound to much more kind of like Moog synthesizer. Like I hear a lot of Moog synthesizer on the songs on um, the, on Servants of the Sun, and I think. Servants of the Sun is kind of like, um, it, it's my favorite Chris Robinson Brotherhood album, although they're all great. Uh, but I think it's it's really uh, sort of their, their ability, Chris's ability to be able to kind of refine that Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia kind of sound and be able to craft it more into more of a song oriented and make the songs more engaging and the keyboards adding a lot more color. Um, than than on the stuff that's that's earlier. So if you haven't gotten a ch if you're a Black Crows fan and you haven't and you like the Grateful Dead and you haven't heard the Chris Robinson Brotherhood stuff, uh, what are you waiting for? The studio stuff is great, and then the live albums are are really good as well. So that's my second one. So my third one is another band is a band that I uh, is one of my favorite bands of all time. It's, I've grown up with this band. I've really loved this band since I was about six years old. I'm talking about Drive By Truckers and maybe not their entire discography, but their first uh, seven, seven or eight are just improvements. So they start, they, they debut with uh, an album in 1988 called Gangsta Billy, which is much more of a country vein with the occasional uh, influences from uh, kind of uh, um, punk, like 70s punk and uh, kind of early alternative rock. And then Pizza Deliverance sees them kind of go into... Uh, kind of introduce more like Rolling Stones and... Um, kind of uh, <clears throat> yeah, like Leonard Skinner influence as well. And uh, Southern rock opera is like their big, is like their Tommy, their Quadrophenia, um, kind of the big concept album about the, uh, the, the rise and fall of Leonard Skinner. And then on that tour, you have a guy named Jason Isbell join the band. And it turns out that, oh, Jason Isbell is also a pretty damn good songwriter too. So then on, Decoration Day, you have the introduction of Jason um, bringing, hit, bringing forth his compositions into the band and also maybe um, kind of uh, um, inspiring uh, Mike Cooley and Patterson Hood to write some of their best compositions as well. And then the Dirty South is even more of a, um, a maturation from Decoration Day in the sense that um, it's sort of like another concept album and Jason Isbell really showing that his songwriting is a force to be reckoned with, that his songs are arguably even better than, than those of uh, Patterson Hoods and Mike Cooley's. And then I'm Blessing and a Curse, it's a very dark album, which I've always appreciated. And it's Jason's last album with the band. Um, he's going to be fired due to his drug habit uh, the next year after this came out. And uh, just their the the band's ability, the band incorporating influences by this point uh, from bands like Blue Oyster Cult and kind of more of a Rolling Stones and maybe the Faces as well. 
um, just their ability to be able to write uh, um, dark compositions and at the same time still being engaging. And, um, and then after that, I think is a little bit of a dip in the discography, although still great. And um, their most recent album called Welcome to Club 13 is been my favorite from the band in a long time after a series of albums that were uh, kind of more political in nature, but still good too. So well, that's my third one, Drive By Truck. Nice. Good job. Very nice. Holy Very crap, cool. Tate. Yeah. <laughs> All right, nice. But that Ambrosia one's a little bit controversial. Yeah. But hey, I like it. it. Because those two first albums are prog greatness. Yes, they American are. American prog. You show me something better than those two records. I, mm -hmm. I, I dare you out there. Anyway, yes, all maybe. Right. I don't know. <laughs> nah, Ambrosia is way more advanced. Right, yeah, than yeah. All right, cool. All right, Jeff. Let's throw it over to you. Give us what? your three. What is? Uh, give us some bands that uh, continue to grow and become better over time. Well, first, I'd like to actually uh, uh, admit that I have not ever heard either of those two Ambrosia albums, but I've heard them mentioned enough recently that I think I'm going to have to check them out. It sounds intriguing. Um, I remember Ambrosia. Uh, I, I was in Chicago in the 70s growing up as a kid. I remember their hits coming on. It wasn't really my thing. But I was still figuring out my musical taste at that point. And uh, I, have, I have no idea what those earlier records are, but I'm, I'm, I appreciate the encouragement to check them out. Okay, so on to my stuff. I got, um, this was hard. This was actually really hard, and I had to spend a lot of time on it because I kept finding every band I thought was going to work. And it turns out there's a big dip where there's, you know, the best album was the second one or, you know, they just didn't improve in order. This, this is actually, I think a somewhat rare phenomenon. Yeah. To, to me, to me, when I come up with these topics for even my podcast as well, like the, like the, the, uh, the mark of a good topic is when there aren't enough examples, right? It's hard to find examples, right? Yeah. This was a lot yeah. of fun. It made me think hard and I, I kind of enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I did come up with one, that I think is a strong, I was afraid this was going to be taken. Um, the, the best example of this I have found is Judas Priest. Rockerola up through and we'll leave some suspense. So um, Rockerola is uh, the John and Music Nut show recently uh, convinced me to go back and listen to it again. And, uh, you know, it's not a bad album, but it's not a great album. Uh, I don't think. And it, they were finding their way. But by Sad Wings, the first uh, the first classic Judas Priest track with the changes, in my opinion, um, all this is my opinion, um, it shows up and, as they say, shit is underway. Um, sin After Sin improves on the formula. Stained Class, I think, would be the first truly great album, or at least the album with more with truly great moments and that's uh exciter for me and beyond the realms of death are um those are real uh kind of landmark um milestone type type songs uh how about for leather you know they're 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 refining and Brit by british steel they've basically come up with a blueprint uh british steel kind of defines what metal, heavy metal, kind of standard, th there's a blueprint for heavy metal in British Steel, I think. Um, it's still got a little bit of experimental stuff, but they pretty solidly have, they pretty solidly have the formula at that point. Um, in fact, I think that would make an interesting topic if you guys haven't done this already. Um, albums that are the kind of the prototype for an entire genre. Um, I can think of a few other uh, examples of that, but I think British Steel is one, you know, they didn't invent heavy metal, but I think they sure as hell did refine it with British Steel. Um, nice. I actually think Point of Entry is an improvement on British Steel. So here's my contrarian side. Um, I really like Point of Entry, and I think it's... Uh, I think the, the streak continues. 
And then screaming for vengeance. I don't think I have to say much about screaming for vengeance. Um, it, there's a lot of great stuff on there. For me, Ram It Down, they, or no, sorry, not Ram It Down, uh, Defenders of the Faith is where it kind of levels out a little bit. You know, they're climbing and they're climbing. And I feel like screaming is a peak. And then they start dropping down and turbo is interesting, but it's not really there. And um, Ram It Down is, there's really some tough tracks on that thing. And then, you know, painkiller and more things happen and yeah. all of that. And that's fine. But that's the arc is Rockarola through Scream for Vengeance. Yeah, I had that in my honorables as well up to Hell Bent because Hell Bent is my favorite album of theirs. But I totally agree with that uh, straight up all the way through Hell Bent, at least for sure. And I, I like your argument for the rest of it, though, too. It's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I feel like Point of Entry also, I mean, really, if there's a crankable priest tune that's not... Uh, on British Steel or Screaming for Vengeance, for me, it's on point of entry. Heading out to the highway, hot rocking, those were some... There's some filler tracks on that album, but they're kind of fun, as opposed to the filler tracks on the later album that I kind of felt like, you know, we don't need no parental guidance. I think they, at some point, and this will be my longest one, because I got the most to say about Priest. I think at some point they kind of became a bit of almost a little bit of a caricature of what they had, you know, they realized it was screaming and then, and then they started to get a little too full of themselves. Maybe there's still some great tracks on every one of those albums. I mean, I love the song ran it down. It's a great song, but the whole album, you know, as a whole, maybe not. Okay. So uh, that's the first one. Um, Everything else I've got is a little bit shaky because there's a dip somewhere. Um, so I'm it's all subjective, though. It's all subjective. It just depends how you look at it. Yeah. So I am actually going to pull out one that I also thought might be taken. And I'm going to argue. Um, I'm going to argue Deep Purple. And there's a bit of a dip. Um, I think actually. You, you kind of have to you, you kind of have to accept that they're this is a band that didn't really have more than three records in a row that were trying to do the same thing. They kept changing what they were doing. And not every change was necessarily received as well as others. But I would I would and so for me, the first album comes out strong. Book of Taliesin, there's great stuff on Book of Taliesin. That's an amazing record. Um, I feel like they were kind of getting a little exploratory in Prague with the, uh, you know, they, they lost a little of the hard rock on the third album, the self-titled. And obviously the, you know, I, I, I kind of don't really even count the the symphony one because it's it's really, it's more of an experiment. It's, it's in the catalog, but it's sort of, I don't know, Martin, you're one to, to think about the purity of the catalog. He's shaking his head. It's dead to me, too. Dead and to me. Is, it, is, that, is that in the catalog to you, or is that like a side yeah. project? Yeah. That's in the catalog, the way I look at it's it. It's absolutely in the catalog. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, and that's, <clears> why, <throat> that's why my, my argument for Deep Purple is a little bit shaky, um, because it's got that those couple, and I don't really consider the concert... Uh, uh, for group and orchestra to be quite exactly in there. It's still pretty cool, but I don't know that I would say it's better. It might be. But then, you know, Speed King, Fireball, uh, Machine Head, sure, falls off a little with who do we think we are, but there's some honestly great stuff on that. It doesn't, you know, it might level out, but it doesn't really fall down. And I would say that given that the two, you know, those two important members left, Dylan and Glover, um, burn is strong as hell. Um, I might these days listen to burn. I certainly would listen to it more than who do we think we are. Uh, maybe more than, maybe more than even any of them. And fireball is probably my favorite of the lot. Um, and Stormbringer got a little more soulful, but I think it really worked. And this is where. You know, you mentioned Grant in the in the description of this topic. Do you trust the artist? And here, 
I trust uh, Blackmore, uh, Lord, and Pace to have adapted to these changes and been, if you count the symphony, four different bands. You know, the first three are together, symphony, Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV is, you know, Blackmore's gone. But that was all, that was just four different bands in the space of like eight years or however many years that is. Um, I think that's pretty impressive. Those albums kept getting good and kept getting better. Um, and I like Come Taste the Band. I didn't at first. I thought it was terrible, but I was it, when I was in high school, I had no interest in it. But it's grown on me steadily over many years. Um, and then I would cap it off with Park Strangers, Return to Form, Mark II, Triumph, and it's just that good. Perfect Strangers nice. is a is the Mark II record we wanted. Cool. Um, yeah, I agree with that. So that's um, that's number two, and number three. Uh, I'm going to go with Wasp, and this also this this one's got a big dip in. Um, the, there's a five album run through Crimson Idol that I think was good. It just they kept learning what they were doing, and you know they came out of the gate on fire, and Crimson Idol was still really good. Um, still not black enough. Really, I, I feel like they're. It, it's kind of what I think of his last mining period. Um, like. He, he just wasn't happy with what he was doing anymore, I don't think. Um, I don't know. I've never talked to him. I have not, you know, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a journalist. But that's the impression I get from listening to the, to the music, is he's kind of gone from triumph and power to kind of complaining about things. Um, Kill, uh, Kill Fuck Die, I think it's called, KFD. Yeah. I just... I hate that record. When you guys did the Black Sheep uh, show on one of the channels, I was tempted to uh, do that, except I couldn't say it because I actually own it. That's how I know it sucks. I just, I just hate it. I, I just, I, I can't. Sorry, I hate it. Hell Dorado is a fluke. It's a beautiful album. I love Hell Dorado. Hell Dorado is Wasp back in the saddle, but then Unholy Terror and Dying for the World, they're Wasp albums. They sound like Wasp, but they don't really have any any hooks. They're they're sort of like two albums of filler to me. Like they they're all credible Wasp songs, but I just don't care. And that that's kind of sad. But I think they pick it back up on Neon God one and two. Um, Dominator I think is really really good, and Babylon actually I think may have the most songs I like on any Wasp album. So they finish strong. Golgotha, I have, but I feel like Golgotha sounds a little more like Holy Terror, Unholy Terror, and Dying for the World. It it doesn't feel convincing. I think they might have peaked with Babylon and they might be, you know, Golgotha fell, fell off. But I think they've got a good run up through Babylon with a major caveat that there's this dip where they just kind of lost a word for it. But I think that's understandable. And if you look at the catalog as a whole, um, they wrote more interesting songs about more interesting things as they went, and they put, um, you know, they put more into it for the most part. And he never really lost it for good. So that's my argument for Wasp. And then nice. I have uh, two real quick honorable mentions because I know I've been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Motorhead. Bastards up through Inferno. Hammered is a little bit on the not so great side, but um, it's still decent. And I think from Bastards, after they kind of settled out a bunch of their lineup problems and figured out what does Motorhead sound like in the 90s, they they nailed it and they continually refined on it. And you know, you could end it at Snake Bite Love, you could end it at We Are Motorhead, you could end it in, in Inferno. That's where I ended. The last three albums are okay, but Inferno was to me the last truly great motor album. And the last one I have is the other honorable mention, 
Tangerine Dream, Green Desert from 1973, which is not released at that time, but that's when it would have come out, as I understand it, through Phaedra, Ricochet, Rubicon, Stratosphere, Sorcerer, and maybe Tangram. And then they were kind of done with the sequencer period and they moved on to a more new age kind of sound, as I understand it. Uh, I'm, I'm missing some albums, but I think that's how the trajectory went. And I think I think um, Sorcerer is actually really, really good. Um, I like all those albums, uh, but I think they kept they kept refining what they were doing and they kept uh, they kept churning out good album after good album. Yeah. My favorite might be Stratosphere. It might be Ricochet, but I, I don't. I can't argue a drop in quality anywhere in there, and it might be Sorcerer. Yeah. So that's that's my honorable mentions. Nice, good awesome, job. dang Jeff, very good, good. good. awesome, and welcome right. aboard. Glad to have you on the panel. For God's sake, I for this. I, I wanted to make sure I, I didn't guess so. Yeah. Been around there. Great. Yeah, nice welcome. Great. All right, Pontus, let's throw it over to you. Pontus was able to come in late to this discussion. I'm sure he's always, he's a, Pontus is ready for anything. Pontus, what are your, uh, what are your picks? Uh, yes, uh, I I picked three, but then I realized I could pick four. Um, let's start with um, oh, XTC. Damn it. XTC is one of those bands that get better through the years, I think. They start out as a sort of um, experimental sort of punk band with the first two albums with the organ. Then they, uh, Barry Adams gets uh, booted out and they, they get Dave Gregory in uh, with um, Andy Partridge and Colin Modling and I never, and a few drummers. They never, never they never settle with the drummer, right? And you've got the golden patch with uh, uh, drums and, and wires and uh, Black Sea, um, English Settlements, uh, Murmur, um, The Big Express. Uh, and, and of course, all the Duke of Stratosphere things, um, the two albums, BP and the album, rather. And you get Skylarking. And then you have oranges and lemons, oranges and lemons, and you get uh, non such. And then you got uh, the strike. <laughs> and then you get uh, uh, these these albums, uh, Apple Venus and uh, Wasp Star. And it's a run of absolute perfect um, British pop, and it it it, it evolves from this punk period through some sort of um, psychedelia to refined Beatles pop. And it's just perfect because they, they uh, Andy Partridge sort of refines what he's writing. Colin Modling is doing the same. And it is a complicated band because it always it doesn't work that perfectly because they always in in you know they always are at the throats but they 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 manage to pull out some of the best 80s music um all the time so it's it's just a fantastic run of albums okay um so that's my that's my number 1 <laughs> and my number 2 is um this is late in the catalog this is Jeffrey Tull. I mean, Jeffrey Tull through, I mean, um, this was from 68, starts with a blues, British blues boom, goes into the progressive stuff on, on um, stand up, um, goes through that, through Benefit, which is more like a heavier um, sort of, um, progressive album. Then you got the the peak with Aqualong, which combines the folk elements and the um, very much the the um, great sort of uh, lyric um, lyric sort of uh, things that um, you, you got themes. Two themes: one is is homelessness, and one is 
is is religion. Then you got thick as a brick. Then you got um, a passion play. Two two monster prog albums with, which is just basically two two compositions. Uh, then you go to War Child, which is, which is more uh, a, a sort of a, a glam rock album. Then you're back with a fantastic album like uh, Minstrel Gallery, which is just a um, combination of folk and hard rock, really heavy. Then you go into another musical that is too old to rock and roll, uh, too young to die. Then they go to folk. They, they, they become a folk band. Uh, Songs from a Wood. Heavy Horses and, and um, Stormwatch. And then the original band splits up, but, um, and he does the, Ian Anderson does his solo album, A, but it becomes a Yefertal album because Chrysalis says so, <laughs> more or less. And, um, and they become more of a fusion sort of band for that record. And then they end that run with. Broadsworth and the Beast, which is them updated for the 80s, a fantastic album. Then there's a bumpy ride after that, but um, it's still interesting to see them going. And there are some late peaks, and I showed um, Roots and Branches from 95 is one of them. Um, so so uh, there is a run that just... Is fantastic. So you'd take it all the way to broadsword, pretty pretty. Yes, much. I do, I do, I do. I I must say, uh, today they announced that they had they will release bursting out live album as a you know one of those boxes, and uh, it went right up at the top of my list um, coming in May. I'm not so sure about. Uh, an under wraps box set though from 84, but um, that is after Broadswood. So that I think they're very consistent from, from 68 to, to 82. Yeah, nice. absolutely. Okay. And of course, <laughs> uh, where do we go? I'm not going to rattle everything off, <laughs> but uh, you know, Frank Sapper, the mother's invention, I mean, Let's face it, you have to be in this if you want to uh, understand the music. It's hard to get in there once, you know, I remember getting into Frank's music and wondering what the, what, where am I going? Where, where, where do I start? Where do I, where do I jump in? But the, but the, but the streak between 66 and let's say 79 is faultless and that's about 20 albums or something like that he just cranked up music that he fought out he just was this enormous um he this source of of ideas um changing um changing his style from record to record there was consi consistency in the recordings. Um, the music was all over the place. You can go from, uh, let's say, Freak Out starts as a, a garage album. Then you got Absolutely Free, that is one of the first major progressive albums. And then you got, and then you suddenly into um, sort of collage. It's like a um, Lumpy gravy and and we're only in it for the money, which is very topical about uh, the sixties culture. And then you go into something completely different that is um, cruising with Ruben and the X, which is a duo album. And then you have Uncle Meat, which is a uh, sort of orchestral sort of uh, chamber rock music. The whole ario genre spins from this album and then you go to Hot Rats and that was a guitar solo album and then you go to um, um, Burnt Weenie Sandwich which is a sort of a combination of what I've been, done before then you go to an, a live Mother's Invention live album called Wheels Has Ripped My Flesh which is just basically jazz 
and then you go into the um, um, Flo oh, and Eddie, Eddie Flo and Eddie stuff, oh. which is cabaret rock oh. um, from Shanghai's Revenge and and for Film Reist and and Two Hundred Hotels, just another band from LA, and then he gets pushed off stage in 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 London and had to you know recoup and and th- decides to make two um two fusion big bands albums grand wazoo and uh waka ya waka and then he took you know forms another fusion band and, and we're into overnight sensation and the uh rocks and elsewhere period and overnight um one size fits all then he finishes that he teams up with Captain Beefheart and do Bongo Fury, then it's absolute blues. <laughs> and then you go into another period where you have with Terry Bossio as a main stay, and you have things like Sutalors and um, the whole lever situation, where you have um, either that, you can think of lever as a as a whole of an album, or you can think of the pieces in that that is um, Sap and York, which is him teaming up with a big band like um, the Brecker Brothers, and you have um, Studio Tan, you have Orchestral Favorites, you have uh, what's the name again, Sleep Dirt, and then you then you back on a by nineteen seventy nine, you're into this sort of he makes one of two two of his most popular albums called you know shake your booty and joe's garage and he just continues he continues doing interesting stuff until the last album which is actually this which is orchestral music um so he was so creative that it's it just amazing that he just went on and on and on and got more refined. Okay, there's dips, there's, there's, who wouldn't, you know, if you do 60 albums, you know, but they're all interesting. And, and, and um, something is always happening. So, so it, it's one of those artists that were climbing a, 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 a path that he, Defined, especially the the seventy stuff is sixties and seventies stuff. Of course, is fantastic. If you go up to to nineteen eighty one, like uh, like um, uh, you are what you is, and and um, ship arriving too late and stuff like that. It's 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 wonderful stuff. Nice. When are you? Sure I, I agree with that one. I I would have. I, I I totally see a trajectory because I don't really give much of a toss for the '60s stuff. I'm not big on the on the early '70s. You get to the late '70s, that's my second favorite part, and I have a lot of love for. We did a Contrarians episode where I I did "You Are What You Is" as my favorite Zap album, but I love "Ship Arriving Too Late." Man from Utopia, Broadway the Hard Way is is a barrel of laughs. It's a great album, right? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I I love that whole '80s end. So breaking it into four pieces, I I would go lowest, then up, then up, then up, and I I I think. Probably the '80s is my favorite uh, era of his. Yeah, I'm the opposite. Mm. I think the Mothers of Invention stuff was far superior. We're only in it for the money. Was absolutely brilliant, mm. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. freeze. That stuff. Frank's not making jokes about crap. It's not childish. It's just mm. experimental. And the songwriting on those records are top notch. He's never achieved that ever again. And funny yeah, you should mention this, Pontus, because we're going to in about. Eight minutes. I'm going to go live on my channel, and we're going to talk about just another band from LA. Oh, funny! You should bring that up. But there you go. <laughs> that's a wonderful. That's a wonderful album. Oh God, no, no, it's not. Wait till <laughs> yeah, I, I, love love it. It. I love it. I love it. Oh, I love it. Oh God, it's just like needle overnight the brain. sensation. That whole yeah, overnight Eddie sensation's period. an absolute classic. That's for sure. That's I, but I love you are what you Dynamo are. Hum. Dynamo Hum is one of the best songs he ever did. Camarillo Brillo. Yeah. That Phil and Eddie period a... makes me want to jump off a building. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Uh, but uh, <laughs> under under <laughs> mentions would be General Giant. Um from 70 to 76. 
uh, even 77. Um, that is just fantastic. Um, the the Jess things from from 68 to 80, 83 even. Um, that would be why that would be something like that. I I love the I don't know if they up to ten albums, but I guess it would be uh the Grateful Dead from 77, 67 up to um nineteen seventy-seven. That's ten years at least. I mean through through the first album to Terrapin Station. I, I, I even make a case for Sh Shakedown Street, but um, then they were more a live band than anything. So, so um, I would go for that. Um, so that's my my case. Nice. Awesome. Good job. I, I just want to make a quick comment before we go because I have to go. Okay. You are one hundred percent right, Pontus on XTC. Um, first two records post punk. They Barry Andrews left. Drums and Wires, they got, got Dave in the band who totally changed. That's when XTC came alive, is when Dave came on, totally changed them. They did not, they never put out a bad record. Now you could be on the fence whether, you know, big uh, English settlement is better than Big Express. You know, if you're Todd Rundgren, you'd say yes. But yeah, I, I I disagree with saying it goes up and up all the way to the end because all my favorites are in the middle. It's either Mummer, my, English Express, think, Black Sea, Skylarking. Those I are think, my four, right? I, but They're you get up cool. to Apple Venus, which I is I think is their masterpiece. That yeah. record is a masterpiece. I know Martin doesn't like it, but that's where XTC finally came into their own. The orchestral arrangements, the way this yeah. record sounds, the sequencing. Bullshit. It's a beautiful record. Absolutely. Yeah. It's their masterpiece. You can quote me on that. All right. Absolutely. I got it. All right. Let's wrap this dog up. I want to thank Jeff. I want to thank Tate. I want to thank Pontus. And of course, Martin and myself. We do want to hear from you in the chat. What albums do you think got better? Or I mean, what artists do you think got better and better with each record? We do want to hear from you. So do that. If you'd like to be on these panels, you could. We also have a Patreon. We'd love to have you. A lot of great uh, discussions over there. We have a Kofi. Please, please buy us a pint or a cup. We'd love that. We have merch down below, too. Buy yourself a damn shirt. Other than that, more great content on the way. So uh, I want to thank these gentlemen for coming on, and we'll see you on the next one. All right.